Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining. Um, I think we'll uh, start on time. Um, before we dive into today's webinar, I wanted to um, take the time to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we are meeting today, and would like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. For those of you who have joined, today's webinar is certainly timely in that the financial year has come to an end. And as organisations begin to plan for the year ahead and reflect on the year that's passed, their focus on the REM is shifting. Ideas that were once considered unconventional now, essentially, present themselves as opportunities for organisations or really even the best path forward. So today we're going to be discussing these types of topics. So what should business be considering in terms of including in their REM review or their frameworks in what we're all talking about as the new world of work and what must be changed as companies adjust to the increasing volatile market that we're all experiencing. This discussion is going to be led today by our speakers. You can see on the screen, we'd like to welcome Chris Parrott. Chris Parrott is the practice leader for the REM practice and brings a wealth of experience and insights into the space. We're also joined by Jenny Anderson. Jenny is a long tenure at Mercer, um, a very seasoned principal consultant, and we're looking forward to her contribution today. And least and not finally, Mike Moses, uh, for many of you who have, who have joined our webinars over the past months, you will see that Mike Moses has had a fairly significant space in the virtual airways. Um, and so we appreciate him joining again. Um, Mike likes to really push some boundaries um, and lead the thought leadership in this space. So welcome to Chris, Jenny and Mike. Lovely to have you. Before we launch into the webinar, just some sort of practical tips about how it's going to work today. We've got a fairly simple engagement model, not too complicated in the virtual platform. So we're encouraging you to use the Q&A box as the primary facilitation in asking our speakers questions. While we do have a chat box, we're really encouraging you to use that chat box as a community to share your ideas, share your experiences and engage in a conversation. However, primarily the speakers will only be addressing the questions within the Q&A box. So I do ask you if you do have questions to pop them into that box. Okay, so let's kick off. Last time we were together, or most of you were together, we were here and we were talking about the REM review. And this is probably the big elephant in the room, one would say. So I'm going to throw it to you as the panelist. Can you share your experiences and observations from the market at this point? Jenny, would you mind leading in and, and, and sharing your observations and experiences? Sure, thanks, Maria. Well, it's still a moving target and figures are trending downwards. Where organisations are making adjustments, they're pretty tactical in what they're doing. Some would say we've even seen evidence of Robin Hood behaviour. You know what that means? We've seen senior pay frozen to fund lower level roles. And we've seen cuts in pay to save jobs. It's not been that popular, but we've certainly seen that in quite a few organisations. There is volatility across different industries. But not only that, since the last session, we've started to see differentiation by state. There's always been some state differentiation of pay and we track and monitor that on a regular basis. However, it's, it's highly evident from the numbers today, you would have even seen in the last couple of days, in Victoria, much higher rates of job losses. It's going to take some of our states and territories longer to come through this. So that means that um, it's going to be more important and I'd be encouraging each of you to be monitoring not just what are the national trends in pay, but what are the trends by your industry and sector, and even what are the trends by geography. And there's still a merging. Chris, what do you think? 
Yeah, thanks, Jenny. Um, it's it's certainly an, an interesting uh, interesting situation. Organisations are starting to consider looking at a, a whole range of different things uh, as a part of the decision making process. Um, and obviously, a lot of these things have been considered in the past. However, looking at a, a range of things and identifying how individuals are affected by more than one of those. So, for instance, um, pay equity, whether you're looking at gender, uh, functional equity, um, tenure-related equity, or, or experience. Uh, so, how, how the individuals are being compared in those sense. Uh, from a performance perspective, I mean, obviously, that's always been close to the top of the list, if not at the top of the list. Uh, also, when there are large gaps between market practice and individuals, um, and, and looking at historical trends from the perspective of practice within different business units in organisations, some who may have led the charge uh, trying to, to out, outrun everyone else um, and, and others that may not have been able to keep up so much. Um, and, and all those things have been considered independently, and they typically are, but then how many of those, if you stack them one on top of another, uh, are creating bigger uh, and more deep-rooted issues for individuals. Um, Mike, um, what do you think about asking the participants for their views? Glad you asked, Chris. Um, as we did in our last session, I think you know, it's important to give you as participants in the session sort of immediate feedback on what is happening in the market. And so what we'll do is what we did very similarly to a couple of months ago, where we'll, we'll start putting up a couple of poll questions um, and you know, we would ask that everyone please um, answer, um, it's anonymous so as truthfully as you can. That'll help us get a pulse and maybe you can tell us. Um, so you'll see on screen here, first question is, and, and as Maria has, I think, rightly pointed out, there's sort of a big elephant in the room about this REM review period. Um, and so we ask those only who have a remuneration review, let's say coming up in the next three months, or maybe you're doing it right now. So what will you be doing? So will you proceed as normal? Will you, you know, proceed as normal, but only for certain groups? That's sort of that Robin Hood behavior that Jenny was talking about. Um, will you delay it, cancel it? Or if you don't know, or it's not applicable, please fill those out. Um, we'll give you about 20, 30 seconds to answer here. And um, once the results come up, I'll, I'll sort of share my views on them. And we can also take a look at see if that's moved from the last time we ran this poll. So it looks like about a third of this group here has already done it. So that's good to know. Um, but the most prevalent one is proceed as normal. So that to me is um, actually quite similar to what we saw the last time. Um, only for certain populations. Um, again, that's you know not as high as I would have expected to see, but quite interesting. Um, delays and um, cancellations also are pretty stable compared to what we saw last time as well. So I guess the biggest change is that we've kind of lost a lot of people who said they don't know, <laughs> and they're starting to make it a bit more real. And um, I guess the, the headline here is that, um, you know, in general, if you add up the first two, it looks like we're... Um, proceeding um, more commonly, but um, you know, maybe not at the level that we uh, had in the past. That's interesting findings. Um, we'll flash the second question now, because I think that you know, now we'll dig a bit deeper into it as well. So for those who are proceeding um, or are delaying it, um, again, for those who it's not applicable, please um, you know, obviously just feel free to tick that. So do you have a best estimate or sort of where you're and you and your business are at the moment around what these salary increases will be. Um, again, if it's occurring over the next few months, be very keen to get um, some points of view there to see if it's trending at similar levels um, compared to last time. So big percentage in that salary freeze category. Um, and that number is actually relatively consistent with the um, salary movement survey that we've been running this year. Um, we'll provide a link at the end for you to gather more data but that 20% figure actually looks like what we saw. And then if you look at the sort of the most prevalent figures, I mean, it's gonna look like it's gonna be in that, you know, two and a half to three, which is similar to last year, um, or the most commonly in that one and a half to 2%, which having spoken to clients purely anecdotally, that does sound like around the right figure, but also interesting to see that, you know, there will be some organizations that are gonna be at that less than one and a half point. So I guess the big takeaway on this one is that Figures are trending a bit downward, and you know it does appear that salary freezes um, will uh, will indeed be you know present coming forward over the next um, few months. We got one more question for you. 
Um, this will um, revolve around short-term incentive plans because um, obviously you know, there's pretty high prevalence. Most of your organizations may be offering this. And so similar to last time, we're curious um, if you have a point of view about what will happen to your short-term incentive plan. So will you pay out at similar levels to last year? Um, maybe pay incentives, but only to certain groups. Again, that's that Robin Hood behavior, um, not pay incentives, or will you reduce the pool by a certain amount? So we put some rounded figures in there, but if you're gonna cut it by 22%, maybe just uh, click on that reduced by about 25% number. Very keen on the feedback here as well, because um, there was a good number of uh, individuals who didn't know last time. All right, so there you go about a third paying at similar levels as last year. I think that's, um, it's good to hear. I mean, uh, <laughs> definitely hope, uh, you know, all organizations can, you know, find the financial means to do that. Um, but that said, the second most common one is that, you know, payments will not be made at all. So um, I think that that's a, a pretty interesting finding. That's a bit of a, you know, tale of two cities. Um, and you'll see the reductions will vary um, by organization, um, and again, that sort of select organization is also not uncommon either. So yeah, I guess the big takeaway for me here is that about a third of organizations will go ahead, maybe about 10 won't pay anything and the rest will pay less than they did last year. And then um, how it gets allocated will be, um, will be uh, I guess, subject to each organization. And as Jenny mentioned, there'll be a bit of volatility by industry. So um, I think that's just one final thing I'll leave you with. Okay, well, thank you for that. Um, that was the interactive portion of the uh, polling, but obviously feel free to drop in some questions. Um, we're here to answer questions as well. And we've received quite a number um, leading into this. And so Maria, maybe um, you can lead us through uh, some of those considerations. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Yes, um, thank you to everyone who did uh, pre-submit questions. We had quite a number of these questions come in and so didn't really make sense to you know answer them all independently so the team worked to you know work through the questions and essentially you know a lot of them came under certain themes and so a lot of the questions really centered around things such as you know the new world of work um, non-financial rewards rec recognition awards and items like working from anywhere uh, so I'm going to really throw over to Chris, Jenny and Mike to really share their observations across a range um, of those topics. Um, maybe Chris, would you like to lead off? Thanks. Sure. Thanks, Maria. <clears throat> so the, the most recent survey information we have in this space clearly indicates that cash is still, you know, at the top of the, the list. So cash is still king. But the, the current environment is presenting issues, obviously, that, that you're all more than aware of, that are starting to say that, well, okay, that's, that's useful to know, but how do we actually leverage what we have in addition to that? Uh, and bringing toward uh, the front of the, the conversation is the total reward picture that an organisation actually has and how they're responding to that. Uh, so MRSA has a, a consideration of total reward, which is built like a pyramid. Um, remuneration and benefits are on the bottom level. They provide the, the basis for, you know, for individuals and it's really about being competitive in that space. Um, but what's becoming more important in this environment is building on that, looking at the components within your reward offering that are not necessarily cash related, but are still things that employees see a lot of value in. Uh, and Maria mentioned the work from anywhere uh, as one example. So workplace flexibility and, and, and what that actually means in the post COVID-19 situation is, or even right now, obviously still in it, um, it. It is more about how do we maximize what that looks like for individuals? Because we, I think, have a, have a new understanding of what flexibility actually means uh, in that well, pretty much everyone wouldn't have expected that we'd be doing what we're doing now uh, six months after this, this thing all started. And, and how do you leverage that and create additional value for employees in that space? Uh, the other aspect of it is the, you know, the, the leverage that you can get from establishing how individuals can go about increasing their own value to the organisation uh, by targeted development focused activities in a certain area to, to gain more skills 
uh, capabilities, whether they're leadership, whether they're technical, it doesn't really matter. Each individual will have their own, um, have their own uh, requirements. But it's that that then provides the opportunity for individuals to increase their own value to the organisation and therefore move into like further career opportunities down the track. I mean, but right now is really the opportunity to take all the steps that you can towards leveraging those non-cash related aspects of your total reward offering. Jenny, would you like to kick on? Sure. I'd like to say a little bit more about the flexible work arrangements. They've been around for some time, as you know. Even when I started in the workplace, part-time work was just coming in as being acceptable almost. So part-time work, job share, adjusted start and finish times, working from home have evolved, certainly in my working career, to become more normal. And they used to be a differentiator when not all organisations offered it. Before the pandemic, about 70% of organisations had implemented you know, in, um, flexible work policies and, and these were being taken advantage of by, by their employees. The last five months, though, employee expectations have shifted. Jobs that we didn't think would flex have flexed and what, was what has been proven is that it's possible. Going forward, employees will be expecting organisations to provide flex, it will not be a differentiator anymore. So the remaining organisations that haven't already done it will need to do it or you'll be lagging behind. So not just working from home, what we have seen now as the next evolution is this concept of working from anywhere. So that means not necessarily from home. I mean, in Victoria, it means from home at the moment. It gives access to organisations um, sorry, gives our organisations access to broader talent pools. So people in regional areas, people overseas even. For those of us who are currently employed and are based in a capital city, it means that we can have the option of a seat change, a tree change, living in a satellite city and all that that brings where there's quality and cost of living advantages. We don't need to be living in close proximity to our employer. Historically though, it's probably important to be aware that pay has been lower if you're not based in a capital city. And we've seen how that plays out in the US where there's been some vast differences between the same job, same employer, but depending which city you're in. We haven't seen quite that difference pardon me, to date in Australia. Secondly, I wanted to talk about innovative benefits that have been coming to the fore more because there has been the um, blurring of work and life. One of them is recharge leave. And this is something we've never really heard of before. What it looks like is a day's leave every two or three months to do just that, rest and recharge. Really creating the space and giving employees permission to not be on. We've also seen um, early Fridays so that the whole organisation shuts down early. If there's not that expectation of being on all the time. We've seen an increasing uptake of health insurance being offered to employees and their families, often with an employer subsidy of some sort. There's been increased investment in home office, not just we'll let you work from home, we'll trust you to work from home, but we actually want to make sure that you're safe, you're comfortable, you have everything you need to be as productive as, as you normally are if you weren't um, working from home. So there's been that investment in, in the setup of offices, a new one called an ideas allowance, a discretionary benefit. And this is one that um, an example to bring it to life is where, um, for instance, a particular fellow was going to be um, speaking at two big conferences overseas in the last few months. That wasn't going to happen. And so he used that um, ideas allowance to invest in a teleprompter and a beautiful home, you know, professional lighting, not quite what I've got here, but um, to, to ensure that he can still um, and did present at those conferences. So for him, that was 
important to his career to be able to do that and take up that opportunity, even though he wasn't going to be flying there. So that ideas allowance, though, could manifest in a whole range of ways. And it was, and it is discretionary for employees. The final thing I wanted to talk about is financial advice, one-on-one -on -one professional advice. And this has been around for a while. Typically, it's been offered to executive level, but the, where it can have benefit now is for employees who may not be getting the pay uplift or not getting that incentive in the same way that they might have expected for this year or maybe even next year or beyond, by offering them financial advice from professionals, they can get the most out of what they're getting to suit their particular situation. So it's something that may have more value now going forward than, um, than previously and more uptake. Thank you. So um, back to Chris. Thanks, Jenny. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about recognition. Um, and, you know, obviously recognition is a, a component that's been in the, the, uh, the, the stack for, for a long time. Um, but in the current environment where people are working remotely, there's not the face time that would have been previously you know, happening on a day to day basis employees can tend to feel a little bit more distant and, and not necessarily uh, in, in the same level of workflow uh, as they would have been in an office. Um, and those on the spot recognition programs, which often require you to have that face time, have kind of taken a little bit of a backseat, but they're becoming more important because the, the environment that people are working in is requiring effort in an entirely different way than, than it previously has been, like maintaining individual motivation meeting timeframes, uh, working with uh, uh, complicated environments at home, um, dealing with children, not dealing with children, not seeing your colleagues, a whole range of things. Uh, and this is, this is sort of moving back up the scale for being uh, something that employees actually value quite a lot. Uh, you know, the, the, the range of um, monetary awards that, that sort of sit within that 50 to $250 range um, are starting to, to get a bit more of a resurgence. Um, it, it really does help in, in terms of maintaining engagement. Uh, and in an environment where a lot of organisations are in that situation where we heard earlier, not necessarily going to be um, seeing their SDI programs pay out in the same way uh, as they may previously, uh, it gives something that can go, go towards making up at least some component of that. Um, which obviously is going to reduce that requirement for that STI spend to a certain degree. Um, but it, it's important to note, and this has always been the case, that it needs to be meaningful. Um, so the, you know, if you were to give movie tickets out in the current environment, you, it might not be such a great idea. Um, so you've got, to, you've got to make sure that the things that you're looking at provide the, the, reven uh, the, sorry, revenue, the, the value that you're looking for. Um, the, the important thing about these, uh, these recognition awards is that the, the small investment that they can, they can represent can actually provide a lot, an ongoing um, benefit for the employee. So if the, if the award is at the upper end of that range, then it's something that they can, they can buy that is actually going to be a, a, like a long, uh, a long lasting item. So every single time they take out whatever it happens to be, uh, or see it on the shelf or whatever it is, it's, a, re it's a, a memory jogger that actually I got this because I did a good job, um, which the lifespan of that sort of thought process uh, is, is often much longer than the average incentive payment um, sort of return on investment period. Um, so I might hand back to uh, Maria. Thanks, Chris. Before we go into answering the next sort of theme of the um, pre-submitted questions, I've just had a scan through the Q&A box and maybe someone might want to take this question by Chris. So the question essentially is, do you see increased work from home practices leading to downward pressure on the salaries market with opportunities for employees outside of the main centres and even outside Australia entering the market? Okay, that's a great question. Uh, and I think that it's, we're getting, we're starting to get into a space where we can hypothesise about what 
the, the outcome might be. But uh, Jenny mentioned earlier the, the environment in the US, uh, and I think that there's some, some instructive you know, practices that we can see uh, over there, um, because they've, their environment is, is quite different to, to here, but certainly in this um, geographically dispersed uh, environment that we're working in, um, where it doesn't matter where you are, it does actually start to get into that space of, well, if we are living in, a, in an area that is low cost, uh, is there a requirement to pay at the same level as if you are living in a high cost area? Now, the, it, it's a philosophical question to a certain extent, because isn't the job the job? Does it matter where you live as to what the job actually requires? Uh, now, if you look at uh, the pay practice within Australia, historically, there's been minor variations on a state by state basis. And if you look at the range around the national median compared to the state based medians, it's been, you know, it depends on if you're, if you're in the middle of a, of a resources boom, then it's probably not the normal um, situation to think about. But that range around the national median on the state by state comparison has typically been around the five, five percent. Uh, so what is that going to look like in this new environment? Um, I think potentially it could lead to uh, changes in some um, environments where if you have a local market that is typically or historically lower uh, and you have an employer that is willing to pay slightly above the local market but still have that amount be lower than the home market that the organisation would employ in, you may actually see increased pressure on wages in um, parts of the country that previously were at the lower end of that um, range around the market median. Great, thanks Craig. Okay, um, we'll get to some more Q&A after um, answering some of the pre-submitted questions. So again, um, you know, uh, one of the themes that came out of those pre-submitted questions was around you know, innovation, emerging trends and innovation practices. So I'm going to um, facilitate that question to uh, the speakers. Um, in terms of that, you know, Chris, we were, we were asked about emerging and innovative REM practices. Are there any that you have seen that you think will take off? Yeah, look, I think, I think there, there are, um, but what I want to say something before sort of talking about the practices, uh, and I wanted to, it's almost taking a step back to that reward strategy perspective again. Like if you, all of your organisations have gone through the process of identifying what's right for you, what the right market is, what you expect, you know, what the relationship between reward and performance is, you know, if, if you have one that's, that, that's a closely coupled, uh, and, the, and the principles that you will have put together, um, I think, need to continue to govern the way that those practices uh, are working. Uh, because we have seen some, I'll say practices, maybe not so innovative, um, but where individuals or um, organisations are finding that their employees are saying something along the lines of, we're not having as good a year this year, um, I'm not going to get an incentive payment, so I'd like you to pretend that the year is going as it should have and pay my incentive payment anyway. Uh, and organisations actually deciding to do that, which is a little bit counterintuitive. Uh, so I think that the, the principles that you have established that guide your reward making, uh, reward decision making, need to continue to underpin any practices that, that you would put in. Um, one of those, uh, which I think is becoming more prominent uh, in terms of innovation, um, is in a, in a way it's a little bit back to the future, and that is like pay for skills uh, as opposed to pay for a job. Um, the nature of individual and specific skills are starting to become more important uh, and, and are attracting a premium in a lot of cases. Uh, and I say back to the future because if you go think um, broadbanded classification frameworks, the intention behind broadbanded frameworks was to be able to recognise increased skill contribution uh, within an organisation, amongst other things. Uh, but the, the nature of broadbanding and the discipline that's required to operate effectively in a broadbanded environment, it can make it difficult uh, to, to manage that effectively. And as a result, that pay for skills took a little bit of a hit historically, but it's starting to become more, more important. 
Jenny, what have you seen? Just, sorry, before I go on, just to add to your point around the uh, state differentials, if I can just backtrack a little bit now I've got the air time. Um, we, we had seen in Tasmania a differential that was quite strong compared to the mainland, and that was very much evidence of you know, quality of life um, and the, the other benefits, the employee value proposition of being and working in Tasmania. Where it can become challenging is when organisations are looking to buy in more talent and they want to go to a different market. So you can start to see within an organisation who might have unpaid local rates of pay, state differentials, to um, not needing to do that, that, they, that within the one organisation you can start to have um, some tensions between some people paid a lot more competitively than others. So that internal relativity is something that I think would need to be watched when we do, do, um, when we do see how this plays out going forward. Coming back to remuneration principles, the principles that have been signed off by your board, by your organisation, by your leadership team, I agree, Chris, should stand the test of time. What can be changed, though, is it's a time to refresh and have a look at um, your frameworks and maybe some of your policies that link to that. And we're sort of alluding to that now. Some of the things that I've been noticing is that there's been an accelerated change agenda for some organisations where they've not, the changes they've been bringing about aren't necessarily directly related to the pandemic, but under the cloud or the shadow of the pandemic, leadership teams have been making changes that in other times might have been harder to get through or might have taken longer to get through. So we've seen you know, CEOs um, changing their leadership team. We've seen organisational restructures happening then enterprise agreement negotiations actually being brought forward at the initiative of the organisation where, where there's been union support. And historically, to get some of these changes over the line would have taken um, a much more protracted process and, and much longer to achieve. So there's actually been some good work and some good things achieved in the last five months where leaders have really seized the moment, if you like, and have and fully pushed forward. There's been a few other things I can talk about. One, um, in Victorian context where I'm based, there's a, around about 250 organisations have already bought out their um, incentives. Now, this wasn't directly related to the pandemic. However, with the pandemic, there's executive um, pay freezes. So to do both those things at the same time, so you're not getting an incentive anymore, and what's more, you're not getting a pay increase either. Um, you know, it's, it's sort of a bit of a bold move to make, and yet it's been done with relatively um, little um, uh, concern, as I think many people look look to their friends, to their family, they look elsewhere and they see, well, I've got a job, but so many haven't at the moment, and and that's. You know, again, it's it's a shifting feast, but it's you know, sometimes getting some changes across in a in a in a pre-pandemic world might have taken a lot more um, bringing people on the journey. Does that make sense? I've also seen that um, in the private sector that ugly head of entitlement um, coming peeping up over the top, and and that has been resulting in a number of individuals requesting a shift in their pay mix. So it's not just pay out my incentive because I haven't hit my targets, but I'd, I'd, I'd like it anyway. It's been, uh-oh, I can see I've historically had good payouts. I'm not going to get one this year, maybe not at all, or the next year. Can I shift my pay so that I don't have such a lot tied up in the variable side and more on the assured cash side? So I, I suspect that these people haven't really understood the concept of what variable pay means. Um, we have seen where they've been um, key talent, people who have been highly valued by the client, by our client organisation. Their employer has rolled over and said, okay, we'll make that change for you. And 
to me that seems a little bit of a backward step. Um, however, um, this is what we're observing. Okay. Now, um, who's next? Mike, did you want to just close out with your, your observations? Sure thing. Um, and one of the things that we did in preparation for this was, and obviously Jenny and Chris have already outlined some of these items, but we'll, we'll put on screen, um, you know, what I consider to be maybe historically has seen um, as blasphemy, um, or maybe you have the opportunity today to actually get some things over the line that maybe historically, um, you know, you were never going to have the chance with the, um, the coronavirus pandemic and all the associated change. Um, might give you uh, that example. So we have a few slides we'll walk you through um, and we'll share these with all the participants in the session um, after this. Um, so first off, um, providing only CPI increases to all employees. So what would this do? This would get rid of the traditional merit planning process or the annual REM review and just say everybody, the CPI for you know, 2020 was 1.2% and we're gonna give you everybody that. So why would you do that? I mean, first of all, if that policy is implemented, it'll increase transparency. So everyone will know every year, generally speaking, this is what I'm gonna get. Um, that 1.4 to 1.6% is almost the same. That, that sort of poking at the fact that, you know, annual REM reviews have become a, almost a battle over decimal places. And I think that, you know, this has been going on for almost a decade now that, you know, the differentiation at these little levels, not very um, you know, palatable. Um, it also will simplify the process. So that can be you know, quite helpful to many people across the organization. Now, we've also outlined some risks and some variations. So one, employees might see this as a takeaway. So any of the suggestions that we'll make you know, could potentially be um, viewed that way. So I think that that needs to be part of a larger communication perspective. Um, also, it could mean that you know, the REM review becomes a bit boring for HR people. So I just wanted to flag that because um, all of a sudden, you know, things get a bit more boring. Variation. So again, if you're doing this, there's also the opportunity to give, you know, a bit more for those who are, you know, below market or high performers, or, you know, you can also just offer spot bonuses in addition to this. These are nothing new, but we just wanted to put that on the table. Another one is around increased superannuation contributions. Um, again, you know, it's a long-term benefit for employees, as Jenny and Chris were already talking about the sort of wider view of pay. This helps with employees' financial health. Um, and I would suggest, depending on the organization you are, if you're only paying at the statutory levels, it could potentially be a differentiator. Um, people might want it now. It can increase fixed costs. Um, another one, and this is something that I do see potentially as a trend. So Jenny illustrated what's been happening in the Victorian government. And this is discontinuing short-term incentives outright. And maybe it's for the right reasons, maybe for the wrong reasons, but cashing them into fixed pay. This would be done to A, give employees more certainty of their pay. I'm sure everyone knows the feeling at the end of the year thinking, you know, am I going to go to, well, back in the day, am I going to go to Europe this year? Or I'm going to go to like, uh, you know, maybe the beach. Um, also, individual performance is hard to get right. We deal with this all the time. So employees or employers struggle to identify who really deserves the most. And it can mean that your performance management system can focus on development. Um, why would you not do it? Can be a takeaway, especially for people who are your top earners, top performers. Um, may lead to a higher cost base as well. So obviously, if fixed pay goes up, it's a higher fixed cost. Um, and there are different ways to cash this out. So you could do this at Target, um, historical actuals, or if you have a budget in mind, you can just work backwards. Those are a couple. I'll go through a few more because I'm, I'm hoping that this might spark um, some ideas. So maybe Paris, we pop to the next page. And a couple more here. So change your STI awards to either a fully team-based model or a profit share model. Now, this is a trend that I you know, do a lot of work in the space and I've been observing with clients that they're really trying to obtain this sort of one team mentality. Um, and again, this falls back on the point I made a moment ago that individual performance is hard to get right. Um, now, there are some risks to that, which is limited line of sight, potentially free riders, but a lot of my clients are seeing that that's potentially a risk worth taking um, to build a culture. Um, and again, some variations. You can do this for only certain employee groups, so everyone below the executive level. Um, nobody really likes this one, but if you're cash-strapped, deferrals to SDI plans 
So it'll help you maintain cash flow. Um, can facilitate retention if it's a multi-year deferral. Um, and again, you can. There are some variations around shares versus cash. Again, you might find people seeing this as a takeaway, but um, it might be a bit administratively challenging. But again, there are some benefits. And the last couple. So some of these, I think, um, these are probably the more a traditional ones, which are to replace all incentives with uh, time vesting shares and share rights. So. I mean, a lot of the ASX companies will offer these time, I'm sorry, these uh, $1,000 share plans and things like that. It's taking that and expanding that to a much larger scale. Um, so you'd give you know, individuals instead of a bonus, instead of an LTI award, just shares in the company every year. Why would you do this? Well, it creates ownership. Um, it's easy to communicate. So instead of thinking, you know, I have all these KPIs to worry about, all I know is that I'm going to get this many shares at the beginning of the year. And if I stick around for two or three years, they're mine. Um, also, participants discount what they don't understand. And a lot of individuals who've been polled that are eligible for performance-based LTI suggest that it's a bit of a lottery. So you're going from an area where people don't really get it, they're discounting it to an area where it's very clear. Just to wrap us up, um, again, there's obviously, you know, payments for poor, for, for poor performance that could come out of that. Um, you have to issue shares or buy them on market. Um, and again, you could do this just for your LTI plan instead of the whole portfolio of incentives, but just another consideration. And finally, this is one that Jenny, Chris, and I were talking about. We thought that might be something new that organizations might try out, which is um, providing additional leave instead of incentives. So that would be giving an extra week of leave as a bonus for someone. Um, and these would be for you know people who might value time more than money. Um, additionally, we talked about this before, but work and life are blurring. Um, and it may be practically affordable, um, given the fact that, you know, we seem to find ways to get things done when people are on leave. And so um, potentially that might not be a big of a disincentive for organizations. That said, you know, there's still potentially an employee preference for cash um, or increase of leave liability. That wraps this up. I might pass it back to Maria. We'll be sharing all these with you. And again, if you have any questions about any of these, you can obviously reach out to us because um, you know, there's more than what we've just shared. Super, thanks, Mike. I'm just conscious of time and we love finishing on time. So I'm just going to do an around the grounds before we close out. So, you know, if there was one single message you could leave our audience with, you know, what would that takeaway be? Perhaps we'll start with you, Chris. Thanks, Maria. Um, I think my, my one single thing is actually an all encompassing uh, think about what you currently do. So today's conversation was about reimagining remuneration. Um, you've got all of the programs that you currently have in place. Um, the question for you is, are they delivering a return on investment that's meeting your expectations? Um, and if you think that that might not be the case, um, taking a step back and looking at them um, from a health check perspective, so what do we expect? Um, what do our, our people expect? And is it giving us uh, the outcome that we, we need from it? Um, if not, then look at how you can recast that component um, because they're, they're there because you thought they were useful at one point in time. Some of them probably still are, some of them maybe a little bit less, but looking at it at that whole of offering perspective is how you will engage your people and continue to, in you know, these tricky times, um, unlock discretionary effort. Right, Jenny. Yeah, so I think sticking to your principles but reviewing your programs makes a lot of sense and seeing that this experience we're all going through creates an opportunity rather than needing to be reactive and seeing it as problematic and that to take a lead within the organisation on really positioning and reimagining for setting you up well for the future. And if your benefits programs are based on your employee personas, maybe have a, a rethink of are those personas needing some adjustment now, given that the experience we're going through is a life changer and potentially for some of um, our people and your people. Mike, did you want to just have closing remarks and lead into the resources that we've got available for people? Your sure thing. Um, I think I might just piggyback off of what both Jenny and Chris said in that, you know, the employee value proposition has been talked about for a very long time. The equation has completely changed now. The opportunity for bringing in talent is greater than it probably was before. 
And you need to be able to have a policy that can meet that. It doesn't mean just salary. It's all the associated work, um, HR policies that you have in place, um, the type of management that you employ to make sure that they're developing your people. Um, I, these are what's going to bring the best talent in the future. And now that your talent pool could technically be bigger than ever, um, you should be looking at this over the next 12 months. Now, um, we do have some resources for you. Um, I'm not sure if we'll put those on screen. We'll also be sharing these by email as well. Um, so there's a couple things that we just thought might be of interest to you, um, given that there's um, you know, a lot of obviously resources that Mercer puts in the market to help you deal with these exact circumstances. So one is that we have a sales incentive pulse survey. A couple of the questions that we'd received leading into this were around, you know, what are organizations doing with sales incentives in the time? Um, if you click on the link that we'll share with you after this, Participate and you'll get a free report. Um, our Australian Benefits Review Survey, we find to be you know, an amazing resource at this time. So Mercer's survey, it's the most comprehensive in the country. And what it does is it outlines all of the key HR policies and benefits that are available, shows you the market prevalence. Now, I expect that that will change over the next few years, but it's good to get a start now. And also it'll just give you some ideas because we've outlined almost all of them. Finally, um, we have this uh, salary movement survey snapshot, sur sorry, snapshot survey. This will be sent out as well. Uh, last time we plugged this as well and we got some good responses. So for those who participate, you get a free report that will help um, build on some of the polls that we had earlier today. And of course, if you have any questions, just reach out. Great, thanks, Mike. Um, so I'd like to really close the session now. Um, thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Mike. Um, some uh, great observations and sharing the insights. I'm sure anyone in the audience who's got any questions can reach out to us directly. But thank you again for one, pre-submitting questions. Thank you for joining and enjoy the rest of the day. Bye. Hey everyone. Bye now.